I'd like to call to order the policy subcommittee meeting and a committee of the whole meeting. Could you please call the roll? Uh, Mr. Nicholson, Chair? Present. Uh, Ms. Ford? Present. Ms. Satterwhite? Present. And observing is Ms. Gately and Ms. Coppola. Great. So the, we're talking tonight about the maximum age of admission. Uh, this had come up earlier in the year uh, because the previous policy, previous policy required this issue to come before the school committee. And uh, we had discussed with the administration whether a change might make sense to uh, streamline that, that process. And so Dr. Tutwiler, uh has proposed in, in our packet a, um, a uh, proposed policy for our review. Do you want to Sure. I'll, I'll just uh, say a few words. Um, so on November 8th, uh, there was that the agenda item uh, wherein I requested the committee's permission to allow a student who had attained the age of 20 uh, to re-enroll in the Lynn Public Schools to finish uh, requirements for graduation. Um, as you stated, the current policy uh, on the maximum age of admission prohibits students who have attained the age of 20 from entering the Lynn Public Schools. The policy does allow for students who are 20 years of age to be admitted, uh, but only when recommended by the superintendent and approved by the school committee. Uh, I'm requesting that the committee consider amending this policy to allow the superintendent to make, that, to make the determination as to whether or not students who have attained the age of 20 be enrolled. Uh, to be clear, this request is born out of a belief and experience. Um, that the current policy does not allow the flexibility to act quickly on behalf of a student. Relative to the case presented in November, the timing was not favorable and the student lost valuable time she could have been in school preparing for the MCAS retake. Uh, I also want to make clear that my philosophy relative to this scenario and any scenario is to meet the needs of students by ensuring fit of program. In the case I presented this fall, the student who had attained the age of 20 was close to meeting all of the requirements and could, in the remainder of the school year, um, complete all of the requirements to graduate. Relatedly, if a student was 20 and therefore beyond the current maximum age and had few or no high school credits, it would be inappropriate to enroll that student in a traditional day program or even LEAP. He or she would be better served by taking advantage of one of the many offering program offerings for young adults in the city. Um, so that's the prevailing philosophy. Uh, while I thought a lot about and researched it, uh, I am not recommending or proposing a change to the current maximum age at this time. Uh, if we were to move the maximum age down, I suspect that there would be a disproportionate and adverse impact on particular groups of students. Uh, moving the maximum age up could also put the district in a place of having to enroll students for whom there are profound program fit issues, not to mention issues around the developmental appropriateness of students age 20 and higher attending with students age 14. Uh, the idea here, here is to make an a shift to the approval procedure, and I'm open for any suggestions for monitoring and or data collection on the topic. Mr. Shadow, um, as you were speaking, uh, uh, Dr. Tutwiler, um, you know, I, I agree that our policies should match our realities, mm -hmm. and we're not, um, we're a unique school district mm -hmm. with uh, the student body that we have. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a reality, and we have that issue um, where we have uh, some students that are around the age of 18 and 19, they work, mm -hmm. they leave school, mm -hmm. but they still have that, those credits that they could mm -hmm. use. So if we can get those students back into the, the mix yeah. without well, having to delay, yeah. I think that that's a good thing because you've come before yep. the school committee as a whole and said that these are problem areas mm -hmm. in our district. Yeah. Um, and I like the fact that it's not just your determination, it's based off of the recommendation of the principal. Mm -hmm. um, that's what you, what, you know, so we, we have that level as yeah. well. So there's yeah. a, someone that's recommending to you mm -hmm. um, and, and justifying uh, why they want this and then you're making the determination as opposed to, well, I think we're canceling two meetings tonight. That impacts more than what we think, sure. especially if someone is, Good is, point. is, uh, is waiting. So. Mm -hmm. um, 
I, I support uh, this, uh, this request. And again, it's, it's important for all of our policies to match our realities. And we, we just can't go with whatever the, the, the template is because sure. we're, we're, we're a unique school district. That's right. Agreed. Okay. I agree as well. I'm, I, I'm in favor of it. <coughs> and I support it. Okay. I pass the gal for a minute. <clears throat> Um, <coughs> yeah, so I, I, I also think everything that Dr. Totwiler and Mr. Sadaway made sense, Mr. Ford. I, uh, to, to Dr. Totwiler's last point about the, the data and reporting, um, I think it would be helpful for us just uh, from a district perspective to understand um, the extent to which this is happening, just so we, we, we know what our kids are doing. And, and also, I think uh, the point Dr. Totwiler made about program fit it's helpful from us from a policy district perspective to know uh, what is happening with the students who, for whom it's not a program fit and where those students are going. And so I, uh, it, it, you know, if, if Dr. Tutwiler administration and, and my colleagues think it would be helpful, I would propose adding something to this policy just saying that the, the um, <clears throat> uh, superintendent would report on, on, a, on a quarterly basis or something the number of students that are uh, requesting this admission or readmission and for those students uh, who were not granted admission or readmission, the, the referrals they got, if any, uh, for, for other programs. Um, is quarterly doable for you? Yeah, I think that makes the most sense. Um, I, 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 you know, I don't know how that would line up exactly with our meetings, but um, you know, four times per year, or I, it probably would be better to name a number of times per year that you would like to hear what's going on rather than say, because I, I just don't know how the meetings would line up. Well, Jared, do you, could it just be in the communication and information section where it doesn't have to be a part of the meeting? It can just be information that were received? It, it could. I mean, I, I think, I think it, I, I'm not sort of, I don't think we need to prescribe exactly the format of the, of the, of the report and the policy, but just that uh, we under, put, to put it into the policy that we understand that this is part of our approach as a district to how we do this. I think it's, it's sort of similar in that we get uh, reports on enrollment figures, and, and it, it may not even be uh, something that we need to openly talk about if, if, the, if it's just one or two, um, but so that it's something that we have our eyes on or have access to. I agree with you. Yeah. Okay, good. Well, even twice a year would be a, you know, I mean, we, we're not talking a, a lot of students. Yeah, it's nice. We're talking a case-by-case -case basis, so I mean, even a, even a twice a year report out would be adequate, I think. Yeah, that's fine with me. So um, you want to make a motion? Yeah, so I'll make a motion to uh, insert to the policy that uh, Dr. Tawala provided uh, that at the, at the end of the, the um, sentence about the, uh, the last sentence that, that, that the superintendent and shall report to the school committee in each, uh, or, and shall report to the school committee twice per year how many persons who have attained the age of 20 years requested admission or readmission in such quarter, and of those students, how many were approved by the superintendent for admission or readmission, and for those students who were not approved, the services to which the superintendent preferred them. You already have it in writing. Yeah. Good. So I can so send that, that to <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll send that. I'll send that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you forward that along your email? Yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I won't. I won't handwrite it. That was second. Um, yeah. Uh, roll call. Uh, Mr. Ford. Yes. And Mr. Nicholson. Yes. Sadoy. Yes. Okay. All right. And so I think we need a motion now to s to send the policy as amended to the full committee. Motion to uh, send to the full committee. Uh, second. Roll call, please. Uh, Mr. Ford? Yes. Mr. Nicholson? Yes. Mr. Saddleway? Yes. All right. Motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. Adjourned. 612. Thanks. We need to wait. Because it's, it's stated. Yeah. It's up to it's up to attorney in my house. Attorney in my house.
Very conscientious. Shows up in your I'd like to call to order the curriculum subcommittee meeting Six, and the committee of the whole. Roll call. Uh, Ms. Cassianis, absent. Uh, Ms. Gately, chair. Present. And Mr. Nicholson. Present. Okay, observing Mr. Ford and Ms. Capola and Mayor McGee. Hi. Oh, and Mr. Saturday. <laughs> Here you are. I missed some of you. <laughs> I missed you. <laughs> observing. <coughs> Dr. Tutwila. Okay, good, get it. So we're going to have a civics update by Shannon Gardner. And an advancement course, advanced <coughs> course work also. Welcome. Two columns are to really just show you how things have changed as, as has been outlined by the state standards. Um, they've, they've combined ancient history and geography. They've added more history. They've lessened the geography standards and broke it into parts one and part two. Um, the biggest change um, is a new course in the eighth grade that this place is the world one course. So that's the United States and Massachusetts government and civic life. And that that's new for most districts and it's gonna be developed sort of from the ground up. As a result of that placement also, um, World One gets bumped out and then in ninth grade you go right into US history, which is not what we had before. So ninth grade was World Two. And that kind of slides everything down. And then they have 11th grade world one and 12th grade world two. As you see, it changes our sequence. Um, and then there were some new high school electives developed by the state. Um, however, districts are not limited to these electives in the areas of social studies and history. Before I move on from this page, do you have any questions? Okay, um, so now go, moving on to this little chart here with the sequence. We can start with the green blocks. Um, this is how it, it's gonna start looking next year. The green level are this year's current seventh graders. They will be taking eighth grade. That will be the first year of the new course. Um, and then if you follow their sequence through the years, you can see that they will be following the outline of the, of the mass frameworks. Um, we have, like many districts are thinking about combining world one and two, um, and I can just simply explain that by saying that there's a lot of overlap between US um, history and world history because all of this history is happening concurrently at the same time. Um, and so we're just gonna look for ways to weave in some world standards into the US so that we can compress world and then that way we can have more, more electives 
and also dive deeper into more world two topics that people are interested in in the in the upper grades that's our tentative plan <laughs> um, now the blue track um, this group are the will be the ninth graders now so they have had world two so they can just <coughs> follow along like they were going to follow along. They're just going to go right into U.S. like they were going to go, U.S. 1, U.S. 2, in the, in the normal electives. Um, the same thing for 11th graders. Nothing's going to change for them because we don't need to redo the world history for them because they've already had it. So hopefully that explains the change in the sequence. It's a big transition and change that we felt we need to make you aware of um, in order to follow the state frameworks. Um, in terms of potential electives, these are really just our notes, the, the history curriculum team about the AP selections. Um, we're gonna have to figure out a track for the AP courses and I've starred the ones that we currently have, the United States history, United States government and politics, AP economics, it's microeconomics. Um, and there are other ones that could potentially happen. <coughs> and the double star is AP psychology, which we're in the planning stages of. So that was my update on civics. Yes. Mr. Nicholson. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you for the update. Uh, okay. Really helpful to, to understand what's going on. I was wondering if you could sort of share some thoughts on how we will uh, be looking at understanding whether these changes are will be successful. Like, what are we looking for uh, to, to understand how effective our civics curriculum is? Um, so right now we're doing some some curriculum development and, and, and we're doing it kind of in two phases. This <coughs> past summer and throughout this year, we're having meetings to determine what, what we can use for our resources, how we can develop that course, um, and what are our bigger needs for more work in the summer for that group to develop ground up. Um, and we're looking at some new things that, that we need to work on, like the, there's an action civics project component, and that, that might be, on the state level, we've just heard about perhaps a performance-based assessment in eighth grade that, that may kind of work in well with an action civics project. So I think that what we're gonna be definitely doing is working with this team and reassessing and and I mean I'll be going in I've already gone in last week to to see how some trials of civics things are going um, and that will just be ongoing it's going to be a, a big shift for people that were used to teaching world two so it's going to take course development and then also monitoring yes so, Shannon, have you had the opportunity, or Ms. Scott, and have you had the opportunity to speak with teachers <coughs> about these changes, and have they helped you develop this curriculum? Because that's something that I like to see, teacher involvement. We have about 40 teachers involved in all of this, all of this curriculum development, not just limited to civics. Um, we have at least six eighth grade teachers involved in the development of the course. Um, so I feel like they do have a big voice in, part in, in, in the development stages. And also, um, when, when the standards first were released in draft form, I did go around to every department and talked about what was projected so that they had a sense of what was projected even before they were ratified by the state. So they have a sense and a knowledge. It's not gonna drop on them like they don't know about it. Mm -hmm. um, and there's gonna definitely be more messaging in the spring. I'll be going around to their meetings again to give them a progress report so that they're involved. And um, I was watching this show one Sunday and it was about, I think it's called Civics One. It's a, a game that students play. 
Are is you it aware of civics? I civics. Yes, I civics. That's what it okay. is. Okay. So, um, in just the curriculum developed for s development for civics, um, our teachers found I civics on their own. Oh, good. Um, and and then we were at a civics conference and we met. Um, the person who reps for iCivics, who is the recently retired um, DESE history person. Um, and he has reached out to us, and we are go going to work with him on actually um, trying to incorporate some of iCivics. The teachers think that it's a really engaging piece that we could, we could weave into the curriculum mm -hmm. because it's an online game where <coughs> you play you role play certain things like you role play a person who's going to be going into court um, involving something <coughs> to do with an <coughs> amendment and you go through the sequences and through that process you learn it's going to help certain yes. kids really understand things mm -hmm. thank you okay and i just oh sorry <laughs> it's okay um Shannon, it ha do we have, an, particularly in the eighth grade where that is all starting new, do we have all the books and materials that are needed for that? And did we do staff development for those eighth grade teachers? So um, we have been using DBQ project binders and for, for all of the secondary grade levels in different topics but they came out with a civics binder, so they all, I've put that in each one, each person's hands to just look through, and there's actually some civics components of World One that they could incorporate them, and they are doing that right now. Um, so they have that. Um, we're also piloting Generation Citizen, which is an action civics project, and they have come in and trained six teachers who are piloting and also working on the curriculum so they can test it out. Um, and then we're going to be able to have an opportunity to work with all of the eighth grade teachers with David Buchanan of iCivics. Um, and anyone who did not receive Generation Citizen training this year will get it next year, which is just a few people, but not, um, not really sure who is going to land teaching eighth grade outside of those six, so we'll see. Yeah. Um, thank you. Oh, uh, I wanted I to add one more thing. <coughs> there is no perfect match of a textbook right now for this course because if you can look at it, it's United States and Massachusetts government and civic life. <laughs> Are those going to be done in sections or? Uh, yeah, they're broken into units yeah. and they. And, and currently part of it are su um, Supreme Court cases in depth that are normally handed handled in the 12th grade. Mm. So we have, to s we have to breed resources in there for them. Well, well the, the good thing uh, I believe um, is that we're able, able to get these uh, kids at a younger age and um, there'll probably be more interest in mock trials and uh, other uh, after school programs that we can somehow create for these students to to learn about uh, government, um, especially uh, for Massachusetts government, that's where they live, so it's important that they, they learn that. I don't mind the sequence, the new sequence. Um, what, are you, what are your thoughts? I know that it's the standard. Um, so I know that the thought with the eighth grade placement was that they can learn, they can learn about their rights and they can learn about the law in eighth grade as it applies to all people in the mm -hmm. country and then it will make sense to them when they hit ninth grade and they do U.S. History One, and they're learning about 1776 because then they'll find out, they'll already know what it's all for, mm -hmm. is for our rights. When they start learning about what happened, it will mean more to them. That's the thought behind it, which makes sense, I think. Great. Um, and if it's required to be in place for 2019-2020, when are we um, going to have the curriculum and books and tools in place uh, for that? So we already have um, we already have all the books for US one. Um, we have National Geographic resources that we can all the books that were in 
eighth grade can move to seventh grade. Okay. Um, and then our main concern is is braiding those resources for civics, and that's what we're going to try to try to work on. Um, the world, as you can see, the world kind of pushes back. So if we need more resources for worlds in the high school, we actually can stage that out so it's in a later year. Mm -hmm. So there's a plan. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Nicholson. Thanks. <coughs> um, so just as a follow-up, I think that, you know, when we think about civics, that was when the, the public education system was imagined, like a really core function of what the public schools do is prepare our, our kids to be citizens and, and, and citizens in democracy and how important that is. And we also know that, and we look around the city and around the country, uh, a lot of people don't use their, their rights to vote, <laughs> to participate in democracy. Um, I, it sounds like uh, you've done some, some great work in, in looking at what the resources out there. You mentioned a conference you've gone to. W have you found districts that you think are doing, uh, are doing things that are, that are preparing that their citizens, their future citizens, that we could, that we could borrow from? Like, what do you think we're going to be doing differently now to better prepare the next generation of lenders to, to, to take over our community? So uh, there are districts that have been doing civics and teaching civics for longer in terms of actually having students do projects. So districts like Malden and Lowell have been doing this for longer. Um, and so I think that what, what we, the change will be for our students is that they're gonna actually, they're gonna actually learn how government works at the local level and they're gonna be able to learn about about how to affect change. Some of the things that they may, you know, call people up to find out about, they may find out they, they can make a change and people are thinking, oh, that's a, something we could do. They might also find out the constraints um, as to why things can't quite happen immediately and that's a good thing too. So they'll learn about government and they'll learn how to participate in government. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, want to make a motion okay. to accept it? Is it do, is this something that we are voting on? I don't. I think I don't think we need to. No, no. Yes. Yes. Updates. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I have also an advance, please. Okay. So just a quick update on advance coursework highlights. Um, I just want to just give you an idea of what's currently happening right now. So currently in our high schools, students occupy 801 seats in AP courses in the district. We offer art, biology, calculus A and B, chemistry, English language and comp, English literature and comp, European history, Latin, microeconomics, Spanish language and culture, physics, statistics, US history, US government and politics. Courses being planned for next year are AP psychology, and calculus B and C. And an additional advanced coursework update is that in order to create computer science courses in the high schools, we have already sent two teachers to AP computer science training. And we're gonna send at least one more teacher to be trained. And our plan is to bring those teachers together to develop a course. So there's that. Um, early college programs are, are counted as advanced coursework for 11th and 12th graders. They're on their transcripts. Um, we currently have enrolled 63 students in the spring semester, and they are taking Comp 1, <coughs> Intro to Criminal Justice, First Year Experience, Pre-Calculus 1, Marketing, Medical Ethics, and Speech. Our gateway to college at North Shore, it's a small program, but an encouraging program. We have six students currently enrolled in it. Um, two recovered students have graduated high school with college credits thus far, and we have um, six students currently who are doing well in the program. And then we have one class of Composition One at Lynn English in partnership with Salem State University. my update. Oh. Attorney Nicholson. Thank you. Um, thanks for that update. That's a really impressive list. That's great. Um, I think 
do we is that list like available on the on the website or can we I can get that to you. Yeah, that would be great. Um, so I think one of the reasons for interest in this is that this is a new criteria for the for the as part of the state's evaluation system. Um, so could you talk a little bit about how we well, what we and I know it's, it can be a little bit hard to get visibility into what the state's plans are is thinking about this, but how we're adapting our advanced courses curriculum in response to what the, the state's expectations are or, or, or goals are for our district to sort of show improvement there. So a couple of things that, that we do is we, we look at can we add more sections um, and can we, can we um, bring on more courses um, with, you know, within, within, the, within the schedule. And um, when we do that, in the spring, I communicate with the schools and find out who do you have that you want trained, what are the reasons, what are the courses, and then we provide training for them in the summer, and that happens every spring where we develop our, our cadre of teachers. Um, and um, we have added on, over the last few years, sections, sections and courses. Like so European history was new, and now we're planning psychology, um, calculus BC, and then we're looking at computer science to eventually become an AP offering as well. So those courses that you listed that we're adding, those will be included in the, the numbers that we're tracking on advanced courses and in, in the criteria. For 11th and 12th graders, Got yep. It. We also have talked about in the past um, programs in the middle school level that sort of connect to these high school <coughs> courses. Do you have any update on, on how that's going or what the plans are there? I can really just speak to the calculus project because that the calculus project that's piloting right now that is to build students' math skills so that more students can enter those AP math classes. And the calculus project is at <coughs> all of the most Pickering. Just Pickering. It, but it, the plan is to bring it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Jeremy, hey. just one other yeah. question. Um, are, you, are you, are you, I'm sorry, <laughs> <laughs> he was the chair. Are you going to have to purchase any things for the um, changes, for, for the, the civics changes? changes. For civics? Only um, because I, I just want to remind you, if you would, just because it's Mass General Law, but to come in with the whatever it is and present it to us, and we can't vote on it on that evening, you know, so I don't want you to come in too late to present us if with the materials that, you know, need to be purchased. Yes, and I understand that, and if there's if we decide that we need a textbook selection committee, which we're not at that point yet for civics, just because we don't think there's a perfect match out there, then we will communicate on that. Okay, and the thing you were talking about, the I civics, you said that you were looking into that. I don't know, I'd probably have to ask the attorney at some point whether that would fall under that coming in I'm not in sure and either, because I would consider that like a supplemental <coughs> resource, not a textbook, but. That's certainly why I'm here to inform you. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you, Shannon. Okay. Any other questions? No? So I motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. <laughs> There's only two of us. Yeah. So. Thank, you. Thank you so much. Thank you Thanks so much. Job.
Welcome uh, uh, to the school committee, uh, regu second regular meeting of the school committee, January 31st, 2019. I'd ask that you all stand and uh, help us salute the flag and then please stand for a moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And I'd like to ask for a moment of silence in memory of Arthur P. Suckelson, retired teacher, on January 14, 2019. Thank you. And I'd like to just make an announcement to the members, and I'll make sure Brian knows. Uh, and I, um, it's probably reflective of the what we heard at the uh, open mic session. But the uh, we've talked about the capital improvement plan that we're developing for the city. Uh, the um, the proposal will be um, presented to the city council on uh, Tuesday, uh, February 28th at 8 p.m. And as I've said before, and I want to make sure the school committee one knows the time and date, and I think it would be great if you could all be there so we could hear the, uh, uh, the presentation on uh, developing a capital investment plan, a five-year plan, what the challenges are, what we're looking to do. So I think it plays right into some of the many challenges we face um, related to capital investment. Obviously, the schools are of uh, key importance to the members of the school committee. So again, uh, it's going to be presented um, at the council chamber on Tuesday, February 28th at 8, 8 p.m. So it would be great if all the school committee could be there as well. So, great. Pardon me? Isn't that 26th is a Tuesday? Is it the 26th? Then it's the 26th, it's the Tuesday, or, is, or it's the 26th. Okay. Thank you for uh, bringing that up, John. I can't keep my days straight some days. <laughs> Thank you. So that, that's an important meeting, and hopefully we can all make it, and uh, we'll be part of the ongoing discussions as we've, uh, we've had in, uh, related to the schools, Pickering, and uh, the challenges we face on the capital side and how we can move forward on that. Um, next on the agenda is um, appointments and elections. Uh, Superintendent. Minutes. minutes. How about the minutes? Yes. Minutes. Oh, excuse me. It's the second time in a row. I've missed the minutes. <laughs> I make a motion to accept the first regular meeting on January 10, 2019. Motion's been made. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed, no. I love it. The ayes have it. The minutes are accepted. Thank you. Next on the agenda is uh, appointments and elections. Yep, and there's one. Uh, Mr. Zachary Fucci, uh, we hired as a PC land tech uh, the week before last. Uh, desperately needed position, and I don't think he is here, but... Uh, we welcome Mr. Fucci and uh, uh, look forward to uh, all the benefits that he'll bring to, to the Lynn Public Schools. Great. Uh, that's great. And we. Uh, that's pretty neat. Yep, great. Next on the agenda is a presentation on the update on schools requiring assistance. Yep, that's me. Okay. Um, if you recall, or as you may recall, uh, I did a presentation back in the fall when the MCAS results uh, had come out uh, to share with you how the targeted assistance school process worked. Uh, what I am presenting to you tonight is an update on the three schools that were identified um, as needing, uh, requiring targeted assistance uh, to give you... Um, just an idea of what the schools are doing and where we're going. Uh, so uh, I just want to review with you, I shared this slide with you as part of my presentation the first time. Um, the arrow is where I'm kind of focusing tonight, but the whole slide shares the different levels of designations, uh, the schools identifying as not requiring assistance and the schools are listed there. The schools um, that the district has identified for framework of support, these were schools that uh, had to meet that criteria of um, they were below the 23rd percentile in accountability and also below 50th percentile in the overall improvement towards meeting targets. And uh, those schools listed there were identified for framework of support. 
the three schools that were targeted by the state, um, it's Pickering Middle School, Fect O'Leary Junior Senior High School, and Classical High School. So I'm going to start with um, some more good news. Uh, Fect O'Leary uh, was identified uh, for low participation rate uh, economically for their economically disadvantaged high needs all students. Um, we submitted uh, with Mara Durgan, Scully, the principal's uh, assistants, and some curriculum uh, team members. We s submitted a Mass Grad Promising Practices grant. Uh, it's a planning grant. We were awarded that grant for $40,000. We found that out uh, just before the last meeting um, that we were here. We we're very excited about that. Uh, the funds from that grant will be used uh, to expand the time and resources to connect with students and families through home visits before and after school. Uh, we feel very strongly that making the connections with families and students has an impact on their relationship with the school uh, and the school-based services that they can receive. Uh, the funds will also be used to develop a contextual learning opportunity uh, we're going to use the funds to develop and implement an after-school career exploration program for the middle school students at Fact O'Leary, uh, along with uh, Lynn Tech. Uh, the students will take a career inventory. They'll explore the different vocational opportunities at Lynn Tech, and will make connections between academic success and career pathways. Um, that uh, bullet is already in the process of planning. Um, uh, the principal of Tech and the principal of Fact O'Leary, as well as Shannon Gardner, have been working already in making those plans to have that after-school program run. We also are planning to train a teacher uh, by the Code Academy and Cisco to create a contextualized project-based computer science pathway at Fact O'Leary that will allow students to develop 21st century skills. Uh, this will be for the 1920 school year. The students will actually be able to obtain a career um, certification in uh, computer field, in the computer field, giving them an advantage uh, when they graduate. Uh, they could actually use that certificate to get a job. Uh, and finally, we're uh, providing collaboration time between the Fecto Leary Guidance Counselor and the Lynn Tech Guidance Counselors to develop a whole school plan to facilitate the MyCap process. Uh, the MyCap process is all about um, career planning for our students. It's actually a state requirement that we're going to have to implement into our secondary schools, our high schools, and uh, Shannon Gardner is involved with that as well. Shannon's got her hands in a lot of things. Um, but she's already begun this process as, as well in getting the Fecto Leary students um, starting on developing that career plan. Oops, skipped. Uh, Pickering Middle School was identified for um, the subgroup, their Asian subgroup, for low performance uh, by their Asian subgroup. Uh, they, we submitted, and I, we've already uh, informed you of this award, uh, we had submitted the Turnaround Assistance Grant, which is also a planning grant, uh, and that was for Pickering and Classical. Uh, Picker, we got that grant. Uh, Pickering was awarded $6,000, uh, and th uh, what Pickering is planning to use those funds for is they're uh, currently analyzing data relative to their subgroup performance. So they're actually looking at who were those students, what were, you know, where was the breakdown for them, and they actually found out that these were actually high-performing students who just didn't perform as well as they should have. So they are actually going to use the money to work with teachers after school to uh, identify some instructional practices as a whole school that they should implement to challenge those higher performing kids. Um, so that is their plan to use um, their money for, is to uh, come up with a school-wide uh, strategy to address that. And that won't just address the subgroup, but it will, uh, it will actually help all students. And then Classical High School um, was also part of that turnaround assistance grant, and they were awarded $29,000. Um, 
they have to go through, or already have, um, a Department of Ed turnaround site visit. Um, it was conducted by American Institutes for Research, or AIR. You might uh, hear us refer to AIR. Uh, their site visit actually was held on January 7th. Um, and they used uh, the preliminary results of that visit on uh, a trip that they just came back from uh, New York. Brian actually was part of that, um, that trip. A whole team from Classical, there was a district representative, union president, um, school committee member, uh, all went, and then Classical teachers and administrators all went to um, New York to the AFT conference. Um, and worked as a team and actually I'm not going to say a lot about that because I want the members of the team to actually give you a brief overview of what that experience was like for them and where they're going with that. They also are going to use the money to uh, conduct a root cause analysis of, you know, using all the data that they have, their NEASC report, the AIR report, um, the CTAC data, which is the consultant that they're using on their student engagement work. Um, they have all sorts of data now that they're kind of weeding through, so that's kind of the stage they're at right now is doing their root, a root cause analysis. And then they'll continue to um, work after school with their teacher teams to uh, develop strategies as a school that they want to um, focus in on uh, to address the subgroups in question. Uh, so if you recall in that first presentation I did, I spoke about the framework of support that, uh, at the district level. We support the schools as well. And this is the same slide that was in my first uh, presentation, and it gives you kind of what criteria we use to determine what schools would fall under the framework of support and what steps the schools needed to take, and then what we did um, in meeting with the principals uh, to determine what they felt they wanted to choose from kind of the menu of uh, opportunities that they could draw off of from the district level. So what I'm going to share with you is what the schools actually chose as options from the framework of support. So for classical, um, for this current school year, they've already been, their math teachers have already been part of um, professional development by math solutions uh, that has with it coaching um, right in the school uh, where they get coached by a consultant from math solutions um, they're doing they've requested to have building based p uh, professional development on differentiation of ELs um, and that is planned for this spring they've asked for peer observations with district level staff and that's ongoing so they uh, say the math teachers want to have a peer observation, um, and so they would contact Eva O'Malley or Shirley Albert uh, Benedict and make arrangements for Shirley to go to the school and do some peer observations with them and then do some debriefing. So they could do that in any content area. And then EL, uh, ELT support, which is that extended learning time that the whole district does, um, but the district um, uh, members will be part of that um, that analysis and work, the ELT work. So district representation will be happening on a regular basis. For next year, um, and of course we're just beginning the budget process, so I don't want to say definitively everything is going to happen. Of course it depends, we got to prioritize, but certainly the framework of support is a high priority. But these are some of the things that we're looking at to be part of um, part of the budgeting for next year. Uh, they want to continue the work with math, math solutions, continue the coaching. Um, they would like research, uh, they'd like to research the um, addition of a math bridge course for students who didn't do well in Algebra 1, like they didn't fail, but they didn't do really well. So in ninth grade, when they take Algebra 1, they passed, but just barely you know, low CD student, is now it, in 10th grade in geometry, but now they have to take the Algebra 1, you know, the Algebra MCAS test. But because they didn't have a solid, really solid understanding of the Algebra 1 from 9th grade, they're not retaining it all. So this would be a bridge class 
that they would take while they're um, taking the ge um, geometry class. So it will be along with, and it will be touching on the algebra um, concepts so that they don't lose the understanding of that algebra. Uh, so that's currently being worked on with uh, Shirley Albert um, Benedict and the high school's um, math teachers, uh, the department heads. They're working on that now to see what will that look like. Um, and then inclusion support with a consultant. Um, they've asked that the special ed department connect them with this consultant, Lisa Diker, um, for strengthening their inclusion support for their students. And then they're looking for next, um, this summer, actually, uh, to do professional development as a school on trauma-informed, uh, the trauma-informed classroom. Pickering um, asked for also math solutions. It's currently in, um, in high school. Uh, they had asked, is there a middle school component? And so we are looking into that now, um, so that that's why it's for next year. Um, because we would have to look at budgeting for it. Um, so they are looking for math solutions, professional development, and coaching. And they are also looking for a foundations course um, to support the sixth grade students um, with math gaps that they have coming in. And then Fect O'Leary this year is already doing Keys to Literacy. Um, they started that this winter, um, and has, it's been very successful for them. Um, and they are looking to get the professional development on the effects of poverty in the classroom this spring, and that is, um, we already have that scheduled for them. And then next year, they're they just requesting can they continue with the keys to literacy coaching with their teachers so that the teachers really have a solid understanding of that um, district-wide initiative. I'd now like to turn it over uh, to three members of the team from Classical uh, who is going to share with you um, a brief uh, overview of their experience from their New York trip and the things that they are, are planning to come back to the school with. Good evening. Good evening. Um, I just want to start um, by saying thank you to Dr. Tutwiler, to our deputy <laughs> superintendents, Deborah Giro and Kim Powers, to Sheila O'Neill, um, and the LPS Teachers Union, uh, the Lynn Business Ed Foundation that partnered with us to, to provide this trip. Uh, we also had a partner, Beth Ponto, Beth Contost, who is the president of the MAST AF Teachers Union. Um, Shannon Gardner came with us, and Brian Castellanos came with us, and they were great additions to our adventure and shared their perspectives with, that, with our team. So that was very exciting. Um, overall, it was a wonderful experience. Um, mm -hmm. It was a lot of well-done professional development, all centering on school improvement uh, and on sustaining change uh, within the school. Uh, we found them very inspirational, and there was a lot of information and strategies to bring back and share with the rest of the staff. Uh, the other big piece of it, it was a great experience for team building um, and collaboration. It was a great time for me being a new administrator in the building to see, <coughs> really see the strengths of the, other, um, of the other staff members with me so that we can leverage that as we go in forward with our school improvement. Um, Ms. Mower, Tessie Mower is going to tell you a few of the highlights, and then I'm going to get back and tell you a little bit about what, how we're going to move forward with our next steps. Good evening. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Amy. Um, so this was a, I want to echo what Amy just said. Uh, this was a fantastic opportunity uh, for team building. Uh, we got a lot of great ideas. Um, we met some fantastic, um, innovative people. Uh, so it was really a lot that was packed into two and a half days. So it was quite an experience. Um, I'm just going to highlight a couple of the takeaways um, from the sessions we attended. Um, I would start by saying one of the biggest focus points was involving student voice, um, engaging our youth and having them be at the table, be part of the decision making, uh, not in the like afterthought, but more at the onset. So that was a huge piece of it, that kind of the thread that moved throughout. Uh, also, we engaged in some exercises as a team um, in collaboration and um, effectively communicating in collaborative groups. It was a fantastic exercise that involved a compass, the compass rose. I don't know if anyone's ever done this, uh, but 
<coughs> it involves some self-reflection and really thinking about who we are as collaborators, how we work with people, um, how we identify ourselves. Are we action-oriented? Are we more nurturers? Um, do we see the big picture? Um, or are we more detail-oriented? So it really helped us to kind of look at who we are as individuals. And the takeaway from that was um, really involving all the, all the voices together. Um, that true collaboration involves everybody at the table. Um, that whole compass, I guess, works together. All the, the directions of north, south, east, and west. They, they use that as a metaphor uh, so that we can remember uh, where we were on it. But to, but to really consider having all those um, styles involved together in decision making. <coughs> we also did some work on data-driven decision making. Um, and we learned a new protocol called the ORID. Um, and the nice thing about that was that it was very objective. It was about looking at data objectively, but also being reflective about it, um, interpreting and making the um, appropriate decisions. So we're planning on using that going forward as well. Yep. Uh, so many more things. Uh, we learned about um, just various strategies for uh, supportive and positive school climate. I'd like to say that at Classical, I know there's a positive school climate. Oh. The culture there is amazing. Um, growth mindset, people are really you know, working together. But this gave us some more information and some more ideas, um, made us think a little bit outside the box. Um, so we learned a little bit more about what uh, trauma-informed practices we could possibly employ, uh, restorative practice as a philosophy, um, culturally responsive pedagogy, there was so much. Uh, that's just some. So mm -hmm. here we go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. so, so moving forward, um, we've, we've had a wealth of data to look at. We just really went through a, a huge self-reflective process with our NEASC visit and pre in preparing for that. We've been looking at data for two years. Um, we've been performing learning walks over the last three years. I have two great department heads that I feel like have really perfected it and really have a nice way of taking everything we learn and getting it back to the faculty. So those are, each, each one I think becomes increasingly better and increasingly more informative. Um, we also just had the air walkthrough, uh, which was a very intense survey. And uh, we had, they actually looked at 30 different classrooms and gave us some real concise feedback on what they saw, what they could see, and what they couldn't see in the classrooms. Um, so with all that being said, we, we really have been digging in, and, and three big ideas have surfaced from that. Uh, one being school attendance, something that we're struggling with, um, especially with some of the subgroups that are identified in our MCAS data as needing support. Uh, student engagement, which we've already, we had identified through our walkthroughs um, in our learning walks as being something we wanted to work, work on. The district has been nice to partner with us and um, allow us to have CTAC and our engagement specialists who have been coming in, giving us quick wins, also doing walkthroughs and looking at our classrooms and doing some diagnostics and really surveying um, our school stakeholders, like our, our staff and our students and our parents. Um, and then finally, and probably most importantly, is our instruction. Uh, one thing that we've looked at and we've had to take a hard look at is we have a variety of instruction going on in the building. We have pockets of excellence. We have a lot of really strong teachers that with some small tweaks I think could make a lot of movements, uh, move, moving forward I should say. And then we have some people that we really need to support so that they are doing the best job with our students. Um, so in, when, in looking at that, we're kind of looking at a two-prong approach. Um, obviously we want to partner with the district and with our growing EL population, we want uh, all of our staff um, to learn strategies to better support that group. Um, we also, with the next generation testing, really see a need to start looking at higher order thinking skills and making sure um, that we're a lot more than Google. You know, we, this, it's no longer a place where you can just impart information and hope the kids take it back. We really need to be teaching these kids skills to find good information, to be able to pick through it, analyze it, create with it, collaborate with it, and be innovative and solve problems. So we really need to start focusing our lesson planning on that. So that's really, those are the three, three big areas that we want to take back and set up subcommittees on so that we can have some strong key actions mm -hmm. moving forward to support those ideas. Um, and another big piece that kind of wraps all of that together is we want to take a hard look at our master schedule and see if it's still um, in the best interest of our students. Increasingly, we're seeing a need to individualize education. 
Um, and part of that is having a responsive schedule where we can do things like schools within a school. When you look at positive turnaround, um, we really need to start looking at what are the needs of our, of our students. And one thing, like Ms. Mower said, that we really do strongly look at our, our students. We, we, we talk to our students. We ask them why they're not coming to school. And lots of them, and not all of them, but lots of them are replying like, I'm working. I'm working 40 hours a week. I'm working 50 hours a week. I'm paying for my own apartment. I live in an apartment that costs $700, and I share it with four people, and I lock my room at night, and we have a common area. So the struggles that they have that are, are keeping them from school are real. So you know, we want to look at things like you know, we have the night school for, for people who can work during the day, but we have a lot of students that are working at night. And how can we support them by getting them enough curriculum and content that they're getting their graduation requirements, but still honoring the fact that they are learning all these skills through work, and they are, they are supporting themselves, and it's, it's a hierarchy of needs in their decision making of why they're coming or not coming to school. Yeah. Also, a school within a school that supports <coughs> our partnerships with North Shore Community College so that our students can get the get what they need out of the uh, high school day but still have the time and opportunity to get over to these college campuses and get themselves credit so that they're moving on and, and having a good start and having higher level experiences so those are some of the big ideas that we came out from um, other big ideas that we had were to possibly allow absent per day um, I kind of walked in on the civic conversation we want our kids more active in the community um, we want to we want to encourage that and have them have the ability to experience different things outside in the community. Um, obviously, considering all voices, uh, we we I think we've started that work, but we want to continue to be thoughtful about including all the stakeholders, especially the students who we're working with. Um, the compass points, uh, the ORID protocol, the community circles. Um, um, it's been very it's it's been exciting to come back and see that the department heads and the, and the staff that went are already starting this work and showing their departments how to do it, so it's, it's very exciting. Um, and then the PD on the culturally responsive pedagogy. That's something that I think um, as a district we haven't really looked at as intensely, but it's something that we really need to move forward to give careful consideration. Mm. That was a long breath. <laughs> <laughs> to be part of the team that went to New York City. Um, I learned a tremendous amount, and I also just want to praise and praise the incredible team. They were so committed and energetic, and I think that no one can calculate the heart of educators, and I got to see that in real time. I appreciated being able to participate also in real time as a district member because I can see their, the ideas that are really sparking their interest that they feel will really help their school and then I can get behind that from the district level and just figure out how to support them. Um, going forward, um, we will be, be also paying attention to um, ways the whole school can impact certain goals, um, some of the chosen goals. One example that Amy talked about that she wants to include in the plan is attendance. Um, and I think the trick is to find out how to really impact that as a whole school. So we, we have small groups of people who have specific jobs related to attendance, like the wellness team. Um, one example our CTAC um, consultant gave us was that you have to think of how the whole school can be involved with that. So if we could somehow get the, the <laughs> impetus for the whole staff to give students that feeling that we are we are all relieved that you're here today then that's going to have a tremendous impact on attendance mm -hmm. um, so that's some of the ways that we're going to be looking at the plan the, the there are specific people doing specific things but how can the whole school be involved in impacting these goals um, I also just want to remark that I enjoyed getting to know Sheila I'm so thankful and and it's always just grounding to have the, the teacher, you know, representative voice and perspective there, as well as member Castellanos. I think we all appreciated getting to know him better and um, appreciated his um, social and emotional lens as a DCF social worker. Mm. Okay. Member White. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your input um, and your overview of your New York trip. <coughs> that, that was. It was good to get that feedback and, and, and to hear um, about what that trip brought back. Um, 
obviously it's a very serious matter. Obviously we have schools that require assistance. Um, I, I do um, have some questions um, mm -hmm. uh, for you, um, Deb. Did we have, do we have any updated data um, from the last presentation? Uh, was, it, uh, was it you, Kim, who brought it the first presentation or was it you as well? It was you as well? Uh, data in what way? Um, when the first presentation was brought to us, we were able to see um, where this information came from, how they found out what schools needed and what subgroup uh, uh, was struggling. There was actual like percentages and, and whatnot. Right, it comes out of the MCAS data. Correct. Uh, so obviously that has not changed. Right, because we yes. do MCAS once a year. We won't see... Um, it, we will not see the results of the work um, until we, you know, till we take MCAS again. We'll get that the what end of the summer, early fall next year. Um, but I, I do want to really stress here that all of this work this year, it's the planning phase of this work. Um, certainly, there are. Um, initiatives and activities that are beginning and, and are, will be happening this year, but it might take time. Like, I mean, I, and I say this from personal experience with Harrington School when it was a level four school, it took us multiple years mm -hmm. to really get the, uh, all the cogs working together um, to really see the full impact of the work. Well, so we'll see you, some you improvements. Just, yeah. I expect we will see some improvements. Um, but I just want to caution everyone that, you know, we all want to see improvements, but it takes time to get um, initiatives and uh, strategies in place school-wide to get it to a place where it's really making an impact on the entire school. And the results from the air site, will they be shared with us? Um, it's, it's just a survey, just so we can, again, this, it, it impacts the district, so it would be good to, to see what, what was said about the survey. Um, and I just have concerns, um, as you were talking about um, uh, in your slideshow, you know, that um, uh, there's a guidance counselor at Lentech that's going to be working with the guidance counselor at Fecht mm -hmm. Um and that there are certain things that um, Shannon is also working on that the MyCap the, the MyCap mm -hmm. um, are we giving them additional resources or uh, just anything that can help with these additional things that are being brought into play because it could be overwhelming when you have all this <laughs> to do you want to speak to the MyCap and we, so the MyCap is sort of building upon a guidance curriculum that we have that we developed under Race to the Top, but it it brings in it brings in a, a lot more personalization for students, and it is more detailed, and it does require more more um, involvement from staff. And so, one of the ways that DESE is asking us to look at it is ways that we can we can make it more whole school so it doesn't fall on one group and we are looking at creative ways that we can we can deliver this it does make a lot of sense and it will be very beneficial for students but yes we're going to have to figure out how to do it yeah okay so so w we understand that there will be there will be a need for possible more resources especially um, potentially yes. yes and i know uh, lentech they have only so many guidance counselors um, so, so that could definitely uh, add uh, because uh, you know, there's a lot of work to, to do at that school as well. Yeah. Um, but I like that the distance is close in uh, proximity and they have um, a, a good career. Uh, We're hoping well. that the work that's going on between FECTO and Lintech uh, with the middle schoolers and with this MICAP piece, that down the road, we will build career pathways for the FECTO kids to be able to access tech during the day, like do okay. uh, off week, like a week of academics w at FECTO Leary and a week of um, shops at tech. Where it's too soon to say that that's definitely going to happen, but that is our hope is that with this work that we're doing um, and the two schools are doing, that that will develop. Well, thank you for the update and, and for answering those questions. I appreciate You're it. Welcome. Thank you. Member Gately. First of all, I want to thank you for your dedication, for your trip to New York, for coming back with such a great 
I hope, strong support to your school. Um, I, I listen to my constituents and when they speak to me about their school or the issues at the school and I bring them forth, um, it showed up this year at Glasgow and there, you have a very strong community and they love it. So after listening to this, what I wanna know is how can I and this committee support you to move forward, to change your schedules, to meet the needs of the students so they can get there, maybe have the morning off if they work at night and come in and work for their classwork and get their credits so that they can move on. Anything that you need, I will be willing to support you. Just call me and I think anybody on this committee would feel the same way. So thank you very much for your dedication. Member Nicholson, then Member Ford. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, just to echo what Ms. Gailey said, thank you for, for the presentation tonight. Thank you, Ms. Ruggiero. Uh, some really great updates on what we're doing. Um, and, and thank you for coming here tonight. Thank you for going down to New York. And, and mm -hmm. what you shared tonight, I, I found really inspiring, the, the self-reflection, the plans, uh, and the, the, the growth mindset you talked about. I could, I could see that and feel that and, and, and appreciate it. So thank you. Um, so I had a question about one of the topics that you mentioned, Ms. Dunn, because um, it, it reminded me of something we were talking about earlier tonight with respect to the goal of incorporating the higher order thinking and sorting information. Um, we, we hear about that a lot uh, in today's world um, with respect to civics and helping prepare uh, – our students to, to be able to identify good sources of information um, and information they can trust. And we were talking about civics earlier this evening and, and the overhaul of the, of the civics curriculum. Is that skill of sorting information and, and sort of teaching how to digest information and evaluate the source versus sort of memorize or whatever, um, um, is that like, is that a lesson plan or is that something that teachers are gonna incorporate into their existing lesson plans that they're already teaching? Um. I think in high school, and I'm generalizing for certain, um, you know, it, the new curriculum that we have in, in history with our DBQs and their primary resources, they're really doing that type of work. Um, so I think it is looking at new curriculums that center around that. But I think for us, and something that we're struggling with and we have to move forward with is there's such an immense amount of information that teachers feel like they need to get out um, and, it's in, in letting the kids do the work. Mm -hmm. um, is, not, not, is, is giving up a little bit of control of how much of that I'm getting out. Um, but we really need to kind of start doing that shift that um, <coughs> not, not maybe giving a little control up of the classroom. Because like I said, if I'm up there and I'm presenting and I, I have my nice PowerPoint, I'm in control of the mm -hmm. action. Um, but I think we need to get to a point where we're comfortable with giving some of that control over to the kids, making sure we're supporting them in that, but having kid-centered classrooms, kids doing the work, students. Got it. Thank you. And then, and, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Oh, Amy, I just want to thank you, know, thank you for the report out tonight and, and also bringing up one of the instances of a student that is struggling, you know, with a lot of responsibility. If you don't see, I know we have our, our attendance initiative, and, and I think we are, the story has to get out more of what some of these kids are going through. My daughter's at Fecto. She tells me stories, you know, every day that that you think these kids are not good kids, but it, it, what they're dealing with and on a daily basis, they're raising themselves and they're, they're, they're you know, supporting themselves at 16, 17, 18 years old. And I, I really, you know, a lot of our critics, you know, don't know what the whole story is. And I, I think, mm -hmm. you know, in some ways we gotta, as you did tonight, get that story out a little bit. I would challenge some of our critics. I don't think some of them would get up in the morning if they had to face that. No, no, I know, so I hear some of the stories, they're brutal, you know, and it's, uh, I, I, I give, you know, anybody in the administration is doing a great job just keeping these kids in school. Mm. Member Coppola. Um, first of all, I just want to thank the Business Ed Foundation because for a lot, a lot of years they have partnered with the Lynn Teachers Union and have bid all the cost. And we haven't bid any of that cost. So we really appreciate it, Sheila, um, all the past people too. And I know that every school that went year after year really benefited by all of that. So th I just want to make sure that they understand that we do care about that. Um, the two things are those, the grant money seems so small, you know, um, 
it just doesn't seem sufficient to do all that we're asking the three schools to do. So what are, what are we looking at? Are we looking at trying to um, find grants out there to... So these grants, these particular grants, are planning grants, which is one of the reasons why they're small. It's, it's all about time for teacher teams to work after school to plan and work through their data to come up with an action plan. Um, certainly, we're always looking for other grants, um, actively looking for them. Uh, there are a couple that I know Shannon has mentioned, I know Dr. Tutwiler has mentioned um, to us that we will most likely be trying to pursue. Um, the curriculum office provides um, funding as well for work. Um, there are like the, the whole civics work that Shannon spoke about earlier. Uh, that was part of the curriculum budget, time for getting all the history and social studies teachers at across from kindergarten all the way to 12th grade together to work through the new standards and understanding the changes. So the curriculum budget also helps to support that. Um, but we certainly are always looking for additional grants to help supplement that. Okay, because I think that the last meeting, that was one of our concerns was is it going to be enough and especially I think you know all of us at the table here all three are really important but it seems like classical is really the one that um, you know has so many students you're covering around 1800 and you do have a good positive culture at the school and it always has been so I think you'll be able to turn it around but um, I'd like it a little faster than <laughs> I'm not Material saying it won't says, be fast. I know, I don't want to push <laughs> it, but... <laughs> We're working hard, I promise. Okay. And, and you shouldn't be... I mean, if there's something you need from us, we should be. You, we should hear it. We shouldn't have to um, yeah. not hear it. Okay. Member Satterwhite, then Member Nicholson. You were here earlier when uh, we had our um, policy subcommittee, but one of the things that I had said, and Dr. Tuttle agreed with me, is that our policies need to ref reflect our realities. And uh, we have a unique school district, so we, we have to um, look and, and, and reassess where we can. And um, I've uh, had to reach out to Dr. Tutwiler a few times on certain things, and, and he's open-minded. And, and he, if he sees a, a need to change the policy, he's going to bring it to us. And, and as you just a couple days ago, we spoke about that. And, and that's, that's important to have someone in, in leadership at the top that understands that. Um, because, you know, a lot of the stuff, if you look at our policies, it's, we get them from Masco. You know what I mean? Like, uh, literally, because it's what most districts use. But we're not like most districts. Um, and today, uh, we agreed to, to change the policy uh, to allow 20-year-olds uh, to go to schools, because that's a reality. These kids work, and sometimes they have to take off from school, and then they decide, hey, maybe I'll come back to school, finish what I need to do, as opposed to getting a GED. So, you know, there are things like that that are challenges for us. And it's data that uh, uh, Dr. Tutwiler brought to us when I first got on, and it's it's still an issue. Um, but this is just uh, these are all smaller issues under the the, the bigger umbrella. Um, and I just wanted to applaud you uh, for uh, hosting the Holocaust um, uh, 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 event uh, the other day. And when you go in, I went to classical, so I'm a little biased. But when you go in <laughs> and you um, and, and you get the, I did go to English, but only for two months. Uh, um, <laughs> But when you go, you get into the, the, the auditorium, you're sitting with the kids, you get that vibe, um, and you, you, to hear that story of the, the Holocaust survivor was, was heart-wrenching, but inspirational at the same time. And um, that's what I like about classical, that it's, it's, it's a family feel. <laughs> and I think that we can, uh, if they understand the family feel and the responsibility that they each have, I think that that can translate uh, to a turnaround. Thank you. Member Nicholson. Thank you. Uh, so another, another thing I wanted to ask you uh, about something you said, Ms. Dunn, was about the recognition of the skills that students were learning when they were working. Um, I was just curious. Um, one, one of the things, initiatives that the district is working on is around social-emotional learning, and I think there's a lot that students are learning who are working that are, that are social-emotional skills. Um, and that's a, you know, a feature of our... Uh, curriculum education at, at Lintec, obviously. That, that, that's what we can do. So 
when you're when you're thinking about how that recognition happens, w- were you talking more in the context of like informally recognizing this is happening and then adjusting the schedules around it, or is there a way to uh, make that sort of a more formal process about skills that so- social emotional skills that s- skills that students are learning as they're working outside the classroom? So one of the for uh, <coughs> quickening is that we want to recognize um, that our kids at, at night school get school to work credits. Mm-hmm. So Another avenue, if these kids have a couple extra hours in the afternoon or in the morning, that they may be able to go out and, and gain knowledge from the people in our community that are already very mm-hmm. successful in doing things. Um, you know, we are not a technical school, so we don't have that built into our curriculum. But we all know that that's an important skill moving forward for them to be competitive both at college and in their their future career. So, you know, we have a lot of ideas on how carving out some time could help the students. Got it. Thank you. And I just had a, a question about the Fecht O'Leary grant. I was just curious. I mean, that, that those programs for Fecht O'Leary looked amazing. I was really impressed by the uh, connection to the career exploration and what's going on in tech. I think that sounds like it has a ton of potential um, in, in, in growing that. And I think it's, it's really something the district can be so proud of, that we can uh, make those connections within the district uh, and something that, uh, like Mr. Sato said, we're, we're unique in a lot of ways. And I think that's one of them that we can be really proud of. Um, I was wondering, was so the, the reason why we were, Fecto was on that list was what, low participation? Mm-hmm. Graduation. And graduation? Mm-hmm. Graduation from Fecto Leary? No, I'm sorry. Uh, low participation, low participation. Uh, of the economically disadvantaged uh, and high needs. But I thought uh, graduation was also. Well, graduation, gra- uh, yeah, probably. You know what? I moved that little box i might have omitted the second bullet i'm sure of it okay. by mistake all right but graduation rate is definitely an area that they are identified for okay yeah so that means i mean i was just curious what, how that was addressing the low participation um but i think the graduation makes total sense in that you would see what your future looks like and and have a uh sort of a uh, more direct uh understanding of what how to how to bridge that gap i guess yeah yeah thank you for that thank you thank you I just want to quickly name that uh, Ms. Mower uh, is new in her role uh, and new to Classical High. Uh, And Ms. Dunn is not new to Classical High, but new in her role. And I just think it's really admirable um, that you're pushing the school, um, you know, in in such incredible uh, and important ways, being new in your roles. It's really worthy of note. Thank you. Uh-huh. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for the presentation and the work you're doing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh-huh. Next on the agenda is field trip requests. <coughs> that would be up to you. Me? Where did it go? <laughs> you forget about Where this one? What's that? I said, did you forget about this one? <laughs> yeah, I got it. I got it. So we, we've got uh, one uh, early request for the annual trip, eighth grade, to Canopy Lake Park uh, in New Hampshire. All requests for out-of-state or overnight require school committee approval. That's on June 11th, uh, and it's a request that I approve. Motion to uh, approve the Marshall Middle School grade eighth to Canopy Lake Park, Salem, New Hampshire, on June 11th, 2019. Second. second. There's a motion and a second. Roll call required. Mr. Castellanos, absent. Ms. Coppola? Yes. Ms. Boyd? Yes. Ms. Gailey? Yes. Mr. Nicholson? Yes. Ms. Sedway? Yes. Mayor McGee? Yes. Next on the agenda is uh, Crossing Guards. Oh, I'm sorry. For Sedway? Thank you. Good evening. Welcome. Welcome. I um. Oh, you're on top of things. 
uh, was receiving uh, much feedback from parents um, uh, about the Crossing God program. I explained to those parents that uh, the Crossing God program is uh, done through the Lynn uh, uh, Police Department. Um, and so I uh, had uh, Mary reach out to uh, the chief and see if we can have um, Ann Magner, who's in charge of the program, uh, come in and just to speak to some of the concerns. And I appreciate you taking the time out of your night to come uh, and speak to us. <laughs> Um, I did give uh, Mary some of the questions that I had. Did uh, those get transferred over to you? Um, Maybe. Yeah, a few of them. This is um, Lieutenant Peter Hawley from the Youth Services Unit. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll ask them uh, uh, out loud if, if that's that's fine. Um, I, I just wanted to say that you're doing a wonderful job considering how many schools we have. Um, as you know, uh, the city does have... Uh, uh, several designated dangerous uh, areas, and those are going to be addressed with the, a grant that um, was an announced uh, recently with regards to the dangerous intersections. So that should help out uh, in, in the near future. Um, but some of the uh, things and questions that I have is, what is it that where you have challenges that we could possibly help in those areas, uh, considering that uh, there might be some days that... Uh, uh, crossing guard is not available or there might be areas where uh, we just don't have anybody placed this year um, I'll just start off a little outline that I did um, here and I, I didn't let my daughter look it over because she's mm -hmm. an English teacher <laughs> at <Thurlby> <laughs> <Mind>. <laughs> anyway, um, this is my lieutenant lieutenant Holy he's the head of a youth service unit um, <coughs> I fall under that as a school safety officer um, and all the SROs, the juvenile detective, and um, school liaison and planning officer, uh, Orrin Wright. Um, I took over the school safety officer position um, from James Flynn in uh, late October of 2006. But in June of fiscal year 2004, um, they had 96 crossing guards at that time. And Officer Flynn, who had the job prior, you know, before I did, he had to take it and cut it down to 42 due to budget. Um, he took three of his senior crossing guards and they had to prioritize locations um, in the city um, to see where were the most dangerous and where they thought uh, they would go. And since I had the job, I was all, um, you know, it's always been like in our budget and it's, it's budgeted for us as not going over 42. Um, They've always been assigned to the elementary schools, um, not the middle and the high schools. It's just even before Officer Flynn, I believe Officer Harold Glass had the job, mm -hmm. and it's always been through the elementary schools and overseen by the police department. Um, they're an integral part of the safety of the schools. Um, it's a dangerous job. Mm -hmm. um, they show a true dedication of the children of the city of Lynn. Um, but they are an aging population. A lot of my guards are, you know, retired. I've had firemen, police officers, um, had a few teachers, postal workers. So they are retired, and, you know, it's a part-time job for them, and they are an aging population. Um, they're out there in rain, snow, sleet, extreme conditions, heat, and their, you know, dedication to the job is a uh, morning like this morning, obviously. Um, I'm responsible for hiring them. Some of them had already been on the job before I took over, so I have hired um, since I took over the job, um, training them, uh, providing equipment, ordering an equipment every summer, end of the summer, uh, keeping track of their hours. I do their payroll uh, every week and keep track of their hours. Um, they have to go through a quarry check, a background check. I do the background check. And every year they have to reapply uh, I meet with them every Friday uh, to give out checks and to give out any announcements or to keep track of if anybody's having any different issues at their school. And at the beginning of the year, there's new parents, new traffic. Um, a lot of the schools are like one way, uh, that one hour in the morning and afternoon, mm -hmm. if they're getting a particular lot of you know traffic going down, I will put something out to the root cars. Mm -hmm in that area to try to keep an eye on that. Um, the guards that are 70 years and over, they have to get a doctor's note and they have to get a doctor to sign off. So a lot of them in the summer, they have their physicals 
and the doctor um, signs off. And I have to re Corey check everybody every summer when they reapply. Um, they work ten, do uh, 10 hours a week. They work the hour in the morning and the hour in the afternoon. Um, and they get um, $13 an hour. Um, we deal with 19 schools that have guards at them. Um, nine of the schools are early schools. As you know, some of the schools um, go in at 7.45, so their hours are like 7.15 to 8.15. And the later schools are like um, 7.30 to 8.30. And in the afternoon, it's 1.30 to 2.30 and 2 to 3. Uh, for the later schools. Uh, Sacred Heart and St. Pius, they get out at 2.30. They're the, um, the latest ones to get out. Um, I used to be a former SRO. I was one of the original SROs in a million dollar grant, and I worked at Pickering for three years. I feel as though I have a close relationship with a lot of the principals in the city. Um, I have three children, and all my three children have gone through the Lynn Public Schools graduated class ago, and I know, you know, countless, <coughs> a lot of the school principals on a personal level, say the only one I don't really know too good is probably the Corbett principal uh, that took over for Sue Garrity, but I did uh, meet him uh, on a lockdown. Um, every spring I also, <coughs> for safety reasons, I take a poll on the crosswalks that need to be painted. Um, <coughs> Every May or June, we look at all the crosswalks and that my guards are responsible for, and others that I may see to myself that say, hey, that's a dangerous spot. I compile a list and I send it to um, Lisa Nerick at DPW. She does a highway safety grant. In the last couple of years, she's, she's done a highway safety grant, and in conjunction, I've worked with her, sent her the list. She's had um, line painting. She has to do it in the summer. It has to be. Uh, in the warm warm months when she does that. So I, I sent her that over the summer. She paints them, um, and I have the guards, you know, take a look at that in September when they start. A um, lot of some, of some other signs that I see, like pedestrian signs, some of the big yellow pedestrian signs. I've also had requests for them, called up DPW, and Lisa's been great um, as far as getting them signage. <coughs> Um, in the school areas that we have. Um, every August I have an orientation meeting with my guards where I go through the school calendar, we give out the calendar, we go through um, you know, all the different holidays when we start, introduce new guards, if I've you know, hired any new guards and stuff. Um, I also, another part of my job, I. Um, work closely with the school liaison and planning, also Orrin Wright. I uh, help him with the spring and fall lockdowns. Um, <coughs> we also help him with the school safety checks, the canine checks. We usually do that at the middle and the high schools. Um, we ha I help with that. And the second part of my job, which takes up a lot of my time, is the, uh, I'm the missing person detective. Mm. You know, the missing persons come through me. I do follow-ups and I do investigations on that. Um, I, I work closely with DCF because a lot of the kids, um, I, you know, are removed from the house. They run from programs. Um, they're kind of chronic. So I've developed relationships with uh, DCF. Um, I have to maintain the records through NCIC. And sometimes, um, usually every three years, we get audited by CGIS. And we have an uh, FBI audit that um, I have to do with Officer Dave Wom um, to make sure uh, they come in and make sure your you know your records are timely and stuff. Um, I developed a lot of contacts with the National Center Missing Exploited Children through doing the missing persons for the last 12 years, so I have relationships with that and. Um, had some crazy cases <laughs> throughout the years. <laughs> some of them, like I said, are easy, um, easy clearance, but you know, we've had some challenging, and I've got to know a lot of the principals in the school, because sometimes at the beginning of the year, we have new children to the school, and kids go missing, or they don't get on the right mm. bus, or they're mm. new to the city. So I also uh, assist with de Detective Jen Cash, who's our juvenile detective. 
and I assist her with any larger cases that she has, um, um, photo arrays, any kind of you know major incidents at the schools, mm. whether it be high school, middle, uh, elementary. But that's just kind of an overview that I kind of um, wrote down. Um, like I said, it's it's all it's money and manpower that we're we're kind of up against. Um, as far as h hiring more, would I like to have more? Um, you know, there is, there is, I could probably <coughs> name off 10 locations now that, that I would like to have, and a lot of it is, is money and manpower. I have a few people out right now because of, um, I guess I have one that has cancer, and one uh, fell and got injured with his arm, and a couple different things. Um, so it's always evolving and switching people over. It's like a juggling act um, to try to try to keep it all um, together. We uh, we understand the frustration that a lot of parents have. Mm. Uh, certainly, every parent wants and probably deserves crossing guard at their school. Um, part of the problem is in 2004 the school population wasn't what it is now. Mm. And so we went to 42 crossing guards. The school population has ballooned. Obviously, more kids, vehicle traffic around mm -hmm. the schools creates this uh, not necessarily an unsafe situation, but certainly a concerning situation for us. We'd love to have more crossing guards. Ian does a fantastic job vetting, hiring, and sometimes firing <laughs> uh, crossing guards, but mm -hmm. um, certainly not something that I would want to do directly. Uh, you know, there are 42 people supervising. Mm -hmm on a daily basis, she does a great job. But we do understand public's frustration with crossing guards and certainly your frustration. Mm. Uh, so say a crossing guard is out uh, with either getting cancer treatment or they were injured. Um, you have a, and I just want to say this one thing before I get to that question, but you see the relationships that the crossing guards do build with the students. High fives, you know, Stress, just uh, the the way that they interact with the kids while they're crossing the street. Those are those are what some kids need. They could be in a, a, a horrible environment at home, negative environment at home. The moment they get to school, the crossing guard knows their name and is crossing the street in a safe manner, like he cares. And that is is what what's needed in these kids' lives. And and I appreciate every minute that these crossing guards. Uh, uh, give to the city I understand it's only 10 hours uh, that's a it's it's a commitment still if you're 70 years old um, I, I what is the uh, procedure currently if a uh, crossing guard is not available is this communicated with the principal of the school and then that principal has the ability to then share that with the general public so the parents are aware or is that not something that we do Oh. <laughs> um, so they have to report to me, and then they usually report to the principal, or I give the principal a call. Okay. Um, to let her know. Sometimes I switch people over. I do have somebody with cancer now that maybe back in the spring I did have to hire for him, but told him that I would probably, you know, have something open up for him. Um, so I could use a couple more right now, and like I said, I have a couple people kind of. Um, going to come back and you know I mean kind of on the fence about that yeah. but I did have to like hire for that so sometimes I um, I have one guy that's out with the flu this week and he does a later school which is a 215 dismissal instead of a 145 and he's doing his 145 dismissal and he's going to another school that's a 215 that's in close proximity to him and he's doing like double duty, mm. and uh, my guard's supposed to be back Monday, but he's had the flu, so, you know, we have switched off like that. I've covered positions before. Um, I know, a a you know, some spots, a lot of the spots are very dangerous spots. I'm not gonna say, you know, any of them are, maybe some of them are a little bit side street, you know, where there's that one way in the morning, one way, so you get a little bit of less traffic instead of, like Western Ave or Eastern Ave, or a major thoroughfare, um, or Linfield Street, something like that. But um, 
I should, to, to Ian's credit, often she does fill in herself. But I've, I've seen her, yeah. My daughter goes to Lynn Woods, and okay. yeah. <laughs> so, um, also, the, uh, the school resource officers are supposed to have part of their responsibility to help manage that. Yeah, so. Okay. Okay. Are we at the 42 number for this year? We're like 38 now. We okay. A couple of people that, like I said, are out with illness. Okay. So you budgeted for 42? Yes, we can't go over. I mean, it's, that seems like a, a small $130 per person per week, at, you know. At, at, at uh, 96, the, the budget item now would be $528,000. We're currently budgeted at 231000 mm. $231, um, for our crossing guards. That's interesting. The crossing guard number went down and the population went up. Right. <laughs> Doesn't make sense. Other questions? Thank you. Th uh, thank you for taking. Thank you very much for taking the time to come out and explain everything about the crossing guard situation in the city. Like I said, I have a, I know many of the um, principals by first name basis. Some of them I have on their cell phone. I have a, in my office. I have a list of all the schools. And the principals in the school. Like I said, because of missing children and lost kids and all mm -hmm. that. And just being an SRO, I've, you know, and having uh -huh. my, my three children in the one public schools, I, you know, know a lot of them personally. And, you know, I'm, I'm always approachable. They, they know they can call me, leave a message, I'll get back to them. Seems like a monumental task. Yeah. <laughs> 42. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much for being here. Thank, Thank you. you. Next on the agenda is a resolution for foundation budget funding. Any discussion? So, should be a uh, resolution that you all have. Yep. It doesn't need to be read, right? We can just vote on it. Okay. I'm so <laughs> <laughs> if you'd like to read it, you okay. can read it, and then we can uh, either have a discussion or vote on it. <laughs> All right, now read it. <laughs> <laughs> Member Ford, please read the resolution. Whereas free public schools available to all students, without exception, are foundational to our democracy and are required by the state constitution, and whereas all of our students, no matter where they live, deserve high quality public schools that teach the whole child and provide them with rich school experience that addresses their academic, social, and emotional needs. Whereas the state's foundation budget formula, which determines state age to each district, has been woefully out of date for years, thereby underfunding our districts by more than $1 billion a year for essential educational services. And whereas an updated foundation budget formula would bring the Lynn Public Schools up $47 million in additional state age each, each year, allowing this district to move closer to providing all students with the education to which they are entitled as residents of the Commonwealth. And whereas the legislator failed to pass any foundation budget legislation in the last session, leaving districts, educators, and students without funds necessary to support the schools, our students deserve in every district in the state. And whereas updating the formula would help the Lynn Public Schools reach appropriate staffing levels to address overcrowding, substantial increase in the English le learner population, and students' emo social and emotional needs, and attend to millions of dollars in deferred maintenance that is threatening our school's learning environment among other needs. Therefore, be it resolved that the Lynn School Committee urges the legislator to approve and fully fund a new foundation budget formula by May 1st, 2019. Adopted July 31st, mm -hmm. 2019. Second the motion. Is motion seconded? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed no, the ayes have it, and we have the resolution, so we will be able to sign that resolution and submit it. So I will say so we have. We'll sign three copies. Thank you for this. <laughs> three. That's a verbatim. <laughs> <laughs> 21. 
million would be a nice little bump. I know. 47 million. Yeah. <laughs> nice job. Nice job. Those are the toys. Yeah. <laughs> For supporting the resolution, and I'm sure that's a sending a strong message from the committee. So thank you all. Oh, thanks. Uh, Next on the agenda is um, subcommittees, and um, uh, put this on the agenda to maybe have a discussion related to the subcommittees. And as we uh, we met and went over our um, you know the protocols and the policies for the committee, we did have some discussions at those meetings related to our subcommittees and how we can interact together on the subcommittees. And I'll, I'll just take, for example, tonight we spent almost a half an hour on one of the subject matters. Um, so the, it was really a, a pretty broad discussion on at our retreats uh, related to both subcommittees and, and uh, again, our op operating protocols and, and making sure that those protocols reflect what the, um, what the committee, the full committee feels about uh, the work we do. And um, I think occasionally and... Uh, um, tonight was an example of that. We need to dedicate more time to a particular subcommittee. Uh, not all the subcommittees, uh, but some of the matters uh, definitely uh, are important to have more discussion on it, and maybe more than one night. So uh, maybe we should continue consider how to use the subcommittee time more effectively and what we can do to address. Uh, it's probably a small number of issues, but there are issues that I think uh, reflect a more broader discussion on it, and that's where the subcommittee work comes into play. Uh, again, the subcommittee um, structure does not always allow for full vetting of that information, uh, so particularly when we're crafting and editing policy. Uh, the sub subcommittee performs the preliminary work in order to help the full committee make the most efficient use of its time. So th that work can be done at the subcommittee level, and then we can have that broader discussion at the, uh, with the committee of the whole. Uh, again, per our stated operating protocol, subcommittee mem members recognize the authority rests with the majority decision of the committee and will not be making decisions without a full vote of the committee. Subcommittees can and should keep minutes of their meetings um, and include them in the full committee packets if they are meeting uh, separately from the, full from the full committee and provide updates to the full committee during regular meeting times. So again, the way we do it now, we, will, we have those meetings beforehand, uh, but I do think when you're looking at some of these subject matters, whether it be curriculum or other uh, discussion, that 15 minutes is, uh, is a limited period of time to really discuss, discuss some of those issues. Uh, and I think it's, it's not just about discussing issues and then coming up with a decision after 15 minutes or a half an hour, but is there an opportunity, particularly on specific issues or of, of interest to the committee, that we can have a number of discussions, both as a uh, subcommittee and then maybe as a full committee, to, to vet and, and, and uh, I think flesh out issues of importance to the full committee. Um, Again, we, we developed uh, the school committee operating protocols as a guide to the conduct 
of our business meetings held in public. Uh, and I think it's important that we not only that when we created those protocols, but we continue to take a look at them and reflect on uh, that we're continuing to um, support what we as a group have uh, agreed to. Um, and whether it's a subcommittee or a meeting of the whole, those protocol protocols are important. Uh, and again, I think it's uh, just just as we talked at the uh, at the retreats, ensuring adequate subcommittee time demonstrates we're making all students our priority, and that we're making every effort to ensure meetings are effective and efficient. Uh, MCAS best practices, and I uh, left a uh, a handout here related to the uh, uh, so the school committee best practices regarding subcommittees of the school committee, uh, and we can take a look at that. Uh, uh, but the subcommittee work based on that report or uh, recommendations can help distribute and develop leadership among the team and allow members to lend their ex expertise to the subject matter. So again, everybody may feel comfortable with the way the subcommittees are working, but I think it's at least an opportunity for discussion as we reflect on the work we do on the protocols we accepted and on the, uh, the discussion we had at these retreats related to subcommittees. Are they working the way we anticipated? Is there a way we can uh, engage the subcommittees in a, in a more robust way? Can the subcommittees lend more uh, information and expertise to the full committee? Uh, so again, I just want to open it for discussion, see what the thoughts are for the members, and see whether we should continue <coughs> that discussion and look at it in a different direction. John, uh, Member Ford. Yeah, I just, I, you know, I'm amenable to anything, but I, I, I think we should keep the committee of the whole format um, as we have it now. Uh, Mr. Mayo suggested we go to that uh, several years ago. And I think what that does, for example, if we didn't use the committee of the whole format, three of us would sit up here who were on the committee, the other three would have to sit out there, and they'd have no input. So then later on in the meeting, when, when that item comes up for discussion, the other three members will, will chime in with their feedback. I think this way we have it now where it's committee of the whole, we all pretty much talk it out, and you know, it's, a, it's, it's not a, usually not a, a contentious atmosphere, and we, and we get the vote, so then w when it comes up later in the meeting, we just have the vote. It's already taken. The three members take it at the subcommittee, but then the other three have already had their input, so they're ready to vote when it comes up. I think it saves, you know, having two meetings almost. Member Satterwhite, thank you, Member Ford. Well, that, I was thinking the opposite. I, <laughs> I, I feel as though, um, so today we had the su two subcommittees, and everyone was on there, and we all heard it. So. Why can't we just do that during the regular meeting and not have two? It, why it, it just doesn't make sense with regards to how a subcommittee is supposed to uh, supposed to to, to, to run. Um, I think um, uh, my subcommittee um, negotiations and um, it works works great. Um, I think because um, yeah, <laughs> um, but you're doing great work. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, it's, I really think um, the, the way the subcommittees are, are supposed to work, you know, when, when you came, became mayor, we met, we talked about what our interests were, where we believe our expertise were, and uh, it was decided what subcommittee we, we would be a part of. And that was done for a particular purpose. So that was done, you know, because Brian's itching to get into to grants because he's the chairperson of grants, and we hear from administration that we need more grant money and you know his he could have a, a, a function in that arena as well um, then we have the other su uh, subcommittees that are for purpose they're purpose-based we don't have any that are wasteful you know they all have a purpose to, to help the student as a whole if you look at each subcommittee so I think that if they're if they're used um, in a way that uh, we can't all appear every day or twice a week or three times a week because we all work and we all have different schedules. But three people might be able to carve out time, do the research, do, uh, uh, do the, um, the, the legwork with regards to that aspect uh, of the, uh, uh, the subcommittee's role, and then they come back and say, this is, what we, this is what we found. And then it's up to the committee as a whole to then vote on that. So that's, that's how my belief of how a subcommittee should, should function. Curriculum should be working with the curriculum department and building a relationship with them to figure out what needs to be done with that. If it's going to be a new textbook or something like that, then that's brought to us and, and, and <coughs> we decide as a whole it, it, either to go with the recommendation of the subcommittee or not. So that's, that's what I believe the, the subcommittee would, would function as. 
Member Gately. Well, today we had the um, a curriculum subcommittee meeting, and um, it was very lengthy. It was half hour. Um, that's typically what it would take or more for a curriculum to be presented or explained to the committee. Um, one of the errors that we saw today was that we put the time of 6.30 in um, when the um, policy subcommittee was done at 6.15, we could have gone easily right into the subcommittee, uh, curriculum subcommittee mem meeting. We would have been done by quarter of seven. So I think that we need to schedule our timing a little bit differently on it, not put a time on the schedule so that we could just flow, have a nice fluid flow from one committee to another. I agree with um, Attorney Satterwhite that we could sit down, but I just don't know logistically how you can do that. Like you have a, a separate, mm -hmm. and you're with negotiation. That's completely different than curriculum because the whole committee wants to hear the curriculum information, but we can't hear the negotiations. So that's why I think that we should just watch our time. Nope. Superintendent. Uh, uh, just quick, just quickly, on? just food for thought. Uh, presentations for subcommittees are tailored to the amount of time they have. It's not really reflective of the kind of conversation that you know, a switch to the new social studies um, curriculum uh, re really requires. Um, there's a big one coming up on social and emotional learning. It's a district improvement goal. Um, I, I can tell you right now, uh, an hour is not enough to dive as deep as we would like to with that subcommittee to, you know, review what we've looked at and what we're you know, what we're thinking in terms of a curriculum for social and emotional learning. So. If you're going to be engaged with us in a textbook adoption, um, the, the subcommittee, it needs to look very different because that's not going to happen in a meeting or in two meetings. If we're going to truly engage you in the process, it's going to be over multiple months. If we're going to be transparent and have you come and, and, and participate in some of that and be well informed, that's not a meeting. You know, that's really a, a textbook adoption is going to require you to participate with us and engage with us over six to eight months. So this is where my problem comes Member in. Member Gately, yes. The problem that I have is could I have the subcommittee for the curriculum meet with you without breaking any laws? But Again, this is, I think this is part of the broader discussion. I don't think we need to make a decision tonight, but I think mm -hmm. reflective of some of the discussion, uh, but the deputy to the superintendent, the superintendent looking at a way to get some of these discussions, you know, it could be, could be broader discussions before the full meeting on the same night. Uh, there could be different ways where we could get these discussion going for the subcommittees to be involved, and then that would be uh, an ability for the subcommittee to inform the committee of a whole on some of these broader discussions. So, uh, again, I'm throwing out... Um, uh, an idea of uh, maybe taking a look at how we work these uh, meetings and how we have that discussion that goes on. It's done differently in other communities. I know that uh, uh, Member Ford talked about it's, it was done differently in the past, and we've moved to this mm -hmm. process we've done now. Uh, but, uh, again, I, it doesn't mean we can't uh, take another look at how th this works and is there a way to get the information both to the subcommittees and to the full committee it w and allowing a more broader discussion on some of the issues of importance that I think we all feel a broader discussion would be helpful for us to understand. So that's, that's why I think I'm putting it out today to have, have us think about it and uh, uh, I think the Deputy Superintendent wants to uh, weigh in as well. One of the things we would like to do at the March 28th meeting, I mean we're going to begin to engage you in the SEL adoption. But what we'd like to do before that formal presentation is outline for you what an adoption <coughs> looks like and then how we would engage you in the full process. It's a proposal for you to think about. Because it's really going to require you, if we're, if we're going to be transparent mm -hmm. and you're going to be fully knowledgeable, you know, to kind of lay out a process of how, we, how we're thinking we could do that. And, and again, I don't think it reflects on every subcommittee, but if there's a specific issue like this that we're talking about, maybe there's an opportunity to have that broader discussion. And again, it, it might mean coming in at 530 on a couple of 
Tuesdays prior to our full, uh, I mean Thursdays prior to our full meetings to start those discussions. So I, I don't know that we could, would, wouldn't be prevented from saying it's a committee of the whole, but really the subcommittees would be the ones coming in early, and you wouldn't be requiring the whole committee to be here unless they wanted to be. But I'm, again, I'm, I'm, I think it's an opportunity to think outside the box and see if we as a committee would like to revisit how we do our subcommittee work and give us more opportunity of broader discussions on issues of importance. So again, I don't think we need to decide tonight, but I would ask the committee members to think about it and maybe with the input from uh, the deputy superintendent as well as superintendent on this specific issue, but maybe on other issues, we can uh, maybe at the next meeting have, a bro have another discussion on, on as you've had time to think about it over the next couple of weeks, what works. Again, some of the members are here, have been here a long t longer time than we have, what worked in the past, what didn't work in the past, but uh, I think uh, we're all here to uh, be able to make the right decisions based on the information we can get, and, and I know that everyone really feel strongly about doing the right thing and, and, and being well informed and, and uh, since I've had a chance to be on the committee over the last little over a year I know how much of a commitment it is on the members on the committee to understand the issues and be a part of those um, understanding those issues and more importantly part of those decisions in a way that we're all informed so I just thought bringing it up tonight was an opportunity for us as as we go to our second diving into our second year together mm -hmm. that we take a look at uh, ways we can work more closely with the subcommittees and maybe use them in a more uh, efficient and uh, productive way. So, uh, again, I've, it's part of the discussion. Again, we don't have to make any decisions tonight, but I, I think it's, I, th I felt it was an important discussion to have. Member Nicholson. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for, for bringing this up. I think it's great for to be reflective about this and, and to be um, open-minded to try, to try new things and, and particularly to meet the needs of specific issues that we're seeing. Uh, I think what I'm hearing is I think there's – couple different issues that aren't quite the same. One is the frequency and the length of the subcommittees. Um, so meeting on, as a subcommittee on nights that are not uh, a regular scheduled school committee meeting and then having more time to do that. And then also the, the meeting is just a subcommittee or meeting as a subcommittee and the committee as a whole. And I, and I think they're two different issues and we can, we can solve uh, some of our, the concerns we're raising here tonight, um, thinking about the frequency and the length and uh, the committee of the whole could, could, could go either way. It's, it, I think um, it might be worth looking into in the, in the, in the meantime if we're going to be bringing up this up again uh, because w one way to address this is with, if, even without changing the rules so that you could so – one of the issues I think some members may have with the, uh, dropping the committee as a whole is that it bars people who aren't on subcommittees from being part of the discussion. Um, I think uh, – one one way to address that without making that kind of drastic change is to think about is there a culture change that we could make as a committee just to, the expectation is that the subcommittee will be there. So if a, a, a member who's not on the subcommittee isn't there, it's not like the member is absent, you know, it, but if a member who is not on the subcommittee wants to be there and be at the table, then they, they can do that because it's a committee of the whole. Um, and we, and we and, and the members who choose not to, to be there because they're delegating it to the people who are experts can then expect to have a report back when, we, when they take it up as a full committee. Um, and that way you're, you're sort of honoring the, the, the subcommittees that want to spend more time, the people who want to develop that expertise, but also leaving that, that possibility open for, for other people. And I guess the, this would be a more um, technical question, but uh, could we have all our subcommittees or three, and we're all in the same number of subcommittees, could you add, have a subcommittee that's larger than, than three? Could you have a four-person subcommittee? No. Okay. Um, and then relatedly, I guess, if you call a subcommittee and committee as a whole, and does that mean you need a quorum that's the full committee in order to meet? Do you understand what we're saying? If you, oh. No, you don't. So, th so, th so, that, so that's relevant, I think. You could, you could call a subcommittee and committee of the whole, and then just the subcommittee could go out the three people, and you, and you would still, could still proceed as, as planned. So. And I think following up on that, Jared, the, 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 the pan out that I gave uh, the Mass Association of, S Association of School Committees gives you kind of an outline of all of those issues, and, and I think we could work with Attorney Myhos related to what we think, how we want to shape it. And if we needed more input from the Association of School Committees, I'm sure they would give us that guidance. So again, I, I, I'm not saying we should do one way or the other, or not, or, or change what we're doing, but I think uh, thinking about it a little bit and uh, addressing some maybe more narrower major issues that we want to spend more time on uh, wouldn't be 
I think, everything that we do. But uh, there are some issues that maybe uh, we all feel we want to have a little more input on um, and that others can get uh, more experienced or, or, or informed on those issues. So, again, I think review that. Uh, think about it a bit, and then let's maybe at the next meeting we can uh, take it up a little bit more and see if there's uh, some ideas that, that we can, uh, I think, find a consensus on and, and uh, address. So, any other thoughts or discussions? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you, you all. And again, I think as part of that, um, I. I think maybe reviewing the protocols that kind of speak to what we're doing as a committee and then I think it does lend itself to particularly the subcommittee work as well. So uh, next on the um, agenda is discussion on uh, two, here, uh, two uh, school committee uh, dates that are uh, a discussion about uh, canceling or rescheduling. So is there, a, I know superintendent, would you like to speak to? Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, I think one of those is something like we're yeah and on, on, and mind you there's some risk uh and apprehension in asking for uh, a canceled meeting in my first year but uh on april 25th um as i think all of you know i'm on the board of the northeast arc um they have their annual um uh they have an annual fundraiser uh and it's a uh it's a not a talent show, because um, I don't have that fashion, fashion show. show. Thank you. And I don't have that either. Uh, but, but but they've asked me to participate, and I would really like to. It's a big deal, and the students are involved. And, and we're all uh, invited. If you want to pay the money, you can go. Sure, absolutely, absolutely. That's, that's yeah. part of the deal. If you can't, that's yeah, everybody free. needs to be yeah. there. We'll get pictures in the next superintendent report, right? Yeah, that's, yeah, I, yeah. I'll make sure you get something. Sure. Sure. I mean, I, I just uh, I think it's. Um, uh, a, a reasonable and appropriate request. So I, I on that. So I, uh, I would, I would uh, be supportive of that. And the other uh, is the. Uh, uh, I know we've done this in the past. Is the, is a local uh, major fundraiser which uh, does scholarships and, and is a charity event. The uh, Friendly Knights of St. Patrick, which is a big event every year, is on. Uh, seems to be typically ends up on a Thursday night on a school committee night. But uh, that is a big local event that again uh, raises money and it's. Uh, uh, going on 75 years of a tradition in the city. So that is the other uh, date that we're uh, looking to uh, vote to cancel. Make a motion that we cancel the March 14, 2019 and the April 25, 2019 meetings. Second. 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 Uh, those will require a roll call. Okay, Mr. Cassianos absent. Ms. Coppola? Yes. Yes, Mr. Ford? Yes. Ms. Gately? Yes. Mr. Nicholson? Yes. Ms. Sadway? Yes. Mayor McGee? Yes. Uh, next on the agenda is um, ratification of votes taken in the policy subcommittee meeting related to maximum age. Yes, we did take a vote. Uh, we voted to adopt the policy with a amendment, um, and the amendment was uh, and j just for uh, Mayor your benefit. We did uh, discuss this a couple of meetings ago regarding the uh, maximum age of entry. We Previously required the approval of the school committee to, to uh, admit or readmit a student who had reached 20 years of age and uh, felt for a variety of reasons, including the, the speed to which that decision could be made and the risk that the student would lose further time and also just the appropriateness of, of individual uh, cases coming before the committee to delegate that responsibility to the superintendent um, and make it at the superintendent's discretion upon the um, recommendation of the principal. And so that policy was adopted unanimously with the amendment that the superintendent report twice a year how many people have attained the age of 20 years that requested admission or readmission in that uh, prior six months, and of those students, how many were approved by the superintendent for admission or readmission, and for the students who were not approved, the services to which they were referred to by the superintendent, and that was approved unanimously. Is there a motion on the floor to accept that? Uh, yeah, and, the, and it was uh, 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 recommended to be adopted by the full okay. committee. Great. Second. So you, 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 we have a motion on the floor to from the committee, and there's a second. Uh, it requires a roll call to uh, uh, for the committee. Uh, Mr. Cassianos absent. Mr. Coppola? Yes. Uh, Mr. Ford? Yes. Ms. Gately? Yes. Mr. Nicholson? Yes. Mr. Satterwhite? Yes. Mayor McGee? Yes. Uh, next is uh, a ratification of votes taken in the curriculum subcommittee meeting. 
uh, civics advanced coursework. No, well, Member this was, uh, this Caitlin? was an informative, um, informative discussion about um, the civics update for our curriculum and the history um, update on curriculum aligned to the new state standards. Uh, also, there was a report of the advanced coursework update by Shannon Gardner, and the committee seemed satisfied. No vote taken. No votes taken. No votes taken. No taken. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and no need of a vote to be taken at this point <coughs> as well. Well, thank you for your report on that. Um, next on the agenda is uh, communications and information in the superintendent's report. Yeah, I'm ready. Okay, so quite quite a bit to share this evening. Um, I think I'll start with the thing that is most on people's mind, and that's the weather. Hmm. Um, we are solidly entrenched in the winter, winter season, and as all, we all know, uh, winter in New England can mean a lot of different things depending on the day. Uh, and I think, uh, in my humble opinion, we've been fortunate thus far in that we've only had a few weather-related concerns, and today's cold being one of them. Uh, I want to make clear that there is no priority higher than the safety of our students. Uh, a close second is the importance, in fact, the sanctity of the school day and all that transpires during it. During this season, those values are really put to the test. Uh, first, it should be known that decisions to cancel are not made in isolation and never taken lightly. Uh, I am in touch with the mayor, inspectional services, and the Department of Public Works in every inclement weather scenario. Accordingly, decisions are both collaborative and informed. When a decision is made, I'm able to test it as I have the benefit of belonging to a group text with superintendents of seven nearby, nearby districts. Here, I seek only to make clear the philosophy and the nature of the decision making. I'm aware that uh, school committee policy grants me the authority to delay opening on any given day. And as I see it, that, that is a viable option in a number of scenarios. That said, I almost want to put a quiz. Does anyone know when the last delayed opening was? Not you. <laughs> and not you. <laughs> it was all, more than 20 years ago. A long time ago. Um, so right now, there's no protocol in place. I've already begun the discussion and planning to have the delayed opening protocol in place for school year 19 and 19 to 20. Done well, the recipe calls for careful, careful planning and a lot of communication. Once complete, the plan, uh, I will present in this forum. Uh, tentatively, I'm planning for the May 30th meeting. Uh, also, as you might imagine, we experienced an uptick in building issues during this season. Last, e last week's issue at Sewell Anderson is a classic example. Heating issues will occur from time to time, much as they do in anyone's home. Here, in addition to the aforementioned values, communication becomes key. In your packets, uh, I've provided you with a timeline outlining how the heat situation at Sewell was handled. In particular, I want to underscore the amount and substance of the communication to families about the issue. This is the standard. In the event um, that issues of this level occur, principals will be communicating with families on this level. I also want to underscore the core value. If there is a less than ideal situation that does not present a safety risk and can be rectified swiftly, I am going to protect the school day. Relatedly, when issues of this sort arise, I will communicate with you directly through Mary Jules, as I did last week relative to the Sewell Anderson issue. And if there are, are, are additional questions or concerns, I, I welcome you to call <coughs> me directly as your constituents are calling you and have questions. Uh, I believe all of you have my cell phone. I wel welcome you to call me. I'm happy to answer any question you might have. Okay. The 
Well, let me just stop. Are there questions? Yes, ma'am. I had parents with concerns because it was so extremely cold and, and school started on the normal time. Mm -hmm. um, was there any chance of opening the doors early? Opening Forget the doors early? Yes. Yeah, because uh, there are some schools that they do not let you in until, you know, I, I don't know if it's a consistent thing. No, it should not be happening, but it is happening. So that is a so request. Are you that saying the students are, are reporting and not they're being in the letting. school yard with the parents waiting for the doors to open? And on days like today, they should not be. The doors will have to be open. Um, actually, it was an, it was another cold day. This earlier in uh, last Thursday, I think. Okay. It was. Okay. Thursday was the day. And um, so it, it's, a, it's a question that's good that we're feedback getting. and we'll ensure you that know, as well that, as somebody who called happen. today, you know, and representing like a larger group of parents mm -hmm. with concerns of not getting into the buildings. Mm -hmm. uh, feedback well taken, and we'll ensure that that does not happen. Right. Uh, and would love to hear directly if it okay. does so we can address it directly with the okay. person wherever it's I happening. think I did pass it along, but I don't know how far it got last okay. week. Okay. okay. I was at the Ford School this morning, and I know that they did let mm -hmm. the students in early at the Ford School. So, Great. Member Satterwhite? What, uh, what I believe, and this could be the issue, is uh, in my house, we automatically think that my daughter has to be at school by 815 because that's what's pu published, but the school instructional uh, learning doesn't start until late 830, I believe. That's when the, the, for, the bell actually rings. So... Uh, I believe that the teachers only have to be there 15 minutes before the bell rings. Go ahead with what you're saying, and then so, I'll, so I'll tell you where the my, wrinkle is. So my thought, obviously, if it's if the kids are showing up at 7:45 or 7:50 or 8 o'clock, the school might not be open yet. But if they're showing up at 8:15, I could see that 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 could be be the issue. I, I'm not I'm not sure of the scenario in this case, but I think we need to have publish the, the 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 right times that's what that's what I'm if there are adults in the building and students arrive and it's a day like today the students should be let inside what well, yeah it's common sense. how many uh, adults need to be in the building if there's just one you want to one just one okay mr. Sadaway as the principal of the Harrington school I stood in the gym with over 200 kids by myself okay so I just, uh, so that's good to know that it's one person. That don't let yeah. the kids in. No one with common sense would let kids stay outside. In this weather, yes. In this weather. Okay. I'd just like to make, make two points. One is uh, I, just to follow up. We do have um, emergency uh, an emergency uh, uh, team uh, that's uh, the schools, the ISD, police, fire, um, <laughs> health, uh, all of the different agencies within the city that uh, both we meet and we're on uh, conference calls before any snow or storm incidents so we are uh, always monitoring that closely monitoring the weather and working closely to make decisions so there is a uh, we had a number of meetings prior to the um, winter season and I think the committee uh, was supportive of our efforts related to those meetings that uh, identified schools that we were going to use for mm -hmm. for off-street parking during storms as well as those that we weren't using so I just want to be clear on that that's that's an ongoing and, and when any storm event happens we are on a conference call and we're working together uh, to both address the storm and then make decisions based on the safety for everyone in the community as well as the schools and I just want to say that I know the superintendent's available because I did call him um, Sunday night and uh, uh, he answered the phone right away although I no, he was sleeping, <laughs> uh, and uh, you know, I didn't realize he was sleeping until later. He said, oh, you, you didn't tell that I woke up right away, but it was an incident that we needed. We may have needed the schools. It was on Sunday night that uh, uh, you might have read it in the paper. There was some uh, uh, issues with gasoline in the, in the downtown area, so there were, initially we weren't sure if we might have needed mm. to use the schools or at least make that available. So I know that the superintendent uh, was quick to answer the phone, and uh, – I know that he's available, so I just know I just want to make that point, and I, I, I you know, we're all, we're all uh, 
available to take those. And, and hopefully you all have my number as well on issues uh, and uh, my cell phone number. And, uh, and of issues of importance, uh, um, I'm more than happy to take the calls as well. I do um, want to reference the, the great um, job that you, you did with regards to typing up a sequence of events that took place. Um, I can't take credit for that. The principal of Sewell Anderson, uh, Sue Garrity, did this? documented uh, how she handled that. The, it's important. Yep. It's, it's very important because this is, uh, this is what transparency is all about. Um, and when you fail at things, it's important to let people know. And when you succeed at things, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's good to talk about that stuff. Um, but uh, being sure that you address issues that um, are, are obviously impactful of, of our students is, is important. And mm -hmm. again, we have almost it's a 15 minute, it uh, feels like every 15 minutes we have an update on this report and it's important. Um, I just want to make sure that the parents are also getting this information because that's, that's the issue. Mm -hmm. that, that seemed to be the issue, but if you read that closely, you'll see um, starting with the open house uh, the night before the issue and the following morning, uh, Miss Garrity was dutiful, as I know her to be, in communicating precisely what was going on. Yes, connect Ed. Yes, I, I've heard about that. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, I want to update you related to a <laughs> facilities concern at Lynn English. Um, there were there have been some concerns expressed about uh, issues related to a burst pipe that occurred last January, and this was, uh, for those of you who are familiar, no small affair. Uh, the damage was significant to the cardio room on the second mm -hmm. floor, and then leaked through the ceiling um, to the to the first floor and damaged offices and equipment. Um, I was on site myself shortly after this happened as was ISD and later the insurance adjuster. Uh, to date, the repair has not yet happened. Uh, the funds were collected from the insurance company shortly after the incident. Uh, these funds were deferred to repair the needs of more, ur to, re to repair needs of a more urgent nature elsewhere in the district, uh, namely uh, some structural issues at Aborn, and I think we're all aware of um, the issue with the gym floor at, at Classical, which received no insurance um, support. Um, the estimate for the repair is a little more than $100,000. I've been in touch with Mike Donovan. Um, that repair is scheduled to happen at the beginning of the FY20 fiscal year, so that's this summer in July. Um, his plan is to with the with the refresh of the of the budget to address that 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 issue at, at English. Okay. Um, in your packet, you'll find two letters uh, regarding the sale of the 19 Porter Street Thurgood Marshall site. Uh, the re, the first letter re requests the solidity the city solicitor um, the city solicitor's opinion on who has ultimate jurisdiction over the property. Uh, in his response, in the second letter, Attorney Markopoulos makes clear that the school committee voted to allow requests for proposals and retains the power to release the control of the property upon review of the sale price. <laughs> I just wanted to keep you abreast of the discourse relative to that property. Both of those letters are, are in your packet. The governor released his budget on Wednesday, January 23rd. While this release reflects part one of three in determining the actual Chapter 70 allocation, it appears as though we might see an increase in FY20. Right now, the budget reflects a net increase of 15.1 million. Uh, we are cautiously optimistic. I've included a graphic uh, representation in your packet. Uh, for what that will mean for the Lynn Public Schools. Uh, I'll keep you posted with updates in the coming months. I suspect that we'll be landing in a more definitive place, and the mayor can keep me honest, uh, in the month of March. Uh, and lastly, uh, concert season is upon us. Uh, in your packets, I've included the schedule of concert events, uh, the first of which is tomorrow evening at Lynn English, 7 p.m. sharp. Uh, most of the events will look familiar, and they're all wonderful. 
Uh, but I wonder, want to draw your attention to one new addition on April 30th. And um, there was some question as to whether or not this was going to happen, but it is, and we're excited about it. There will be a middle school, high school, citywide jazz so showcase um, at City Hall. Mm -hmm. uh, and this will be done in conjunction with Art Week in the city, and we're excited about that and all of the events on that sheet, and that's all I have this evening. I, th I think I'm excited about that, um, and I know many, uh, some of us were at the um, 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 Superintendent uh, Latham's uh, event at the Lynn English. Uh, all of the schools uh, had a chance to showcase their skills. It was really a great concert, and uh, I want to thank the superintendent for helping put together an opportunity to showcase the great talent at the Lynn Auditorium on, on April 30th, so I would hope that we would uh, highlight that uh, on our own to uh, to hopefully get an, enough uh, of a, get a nice crowd there, uh, and I think it's uh, with all of the amazing shows that are going on there. I think it's a great opportunity for the students to be able to showcase their skills in what is really one of the premier um, venues for entertainment in the region and is continuing to grow. So that's an exciting night, and I just want to make a point on the on the <coughs> governor's budget uh, as I've lived through this uh, for many years uh, until the signature is on the. Uh, the final budget uh, and the overrides do or don't happen that is when we know what the numbers are so uh, in March or April we will know the house's uh, recommendations and when they release their budget so I just uh, uh, it's uh, those are preliminary numbers but um, uh, until we know what the final numbers are we won't be able to uh, uh, I mean obviously we will I think we'll try and be conservative and reflect uh, as we go through our budget uh, and I'll just give you a uh, uh, we are in the middle of uh, right now meeting with all the department heads related to the city budget, uh, and that's going on much earlier than it has been in the past. Uh, we'll complete that over the next week. Uh, we anticipate um, individual meetings again with the CFO related to those department head meetings, uh, and then probably six or seven weeks from now we'll be having uh, additional meetings with the department heads. Uh, obviously, we'll be working very closely with the schools related to a, uh, creating a budget for the city as well as the schools, uh, and we're hoping uh, to have by late April or first of May uh, a full budget uh, to the council which will give us a couple of months the council a chance to go through it so we're really looking to have uh, a much earlier process so that we can have an idea on what the budget looks like where we are and where we need to go uh, I think in the past it's been a mid to late June uh, so that we, we as well as the the full city budget uh, <coughs> we're waiting on that uh, in the past and, and so I think we're we're being very proactive, working closely with the department heads, working with the schools, and we're really going to try and produce a budget that reflects uh, uh, what the budget looks like uh, early enough for us to have a, get our hands around it. Uh, so I just want to give uh, give you all an uh, update on the on the uh, what the process will be as well as the timeline. Make a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed no. The ayes have it. Thank you all. Great.